Hollywood. How, what was the film that brought you here? I mean, you obviously have had a, a good career in Europe going, and what was the first thing that um, got your attention? Uh, the first film that brought attention here was Girl with a Bell Earring. Mm -hmm. Peter Weber's film with Scarlett Johansson and Colin Firth in 2003 or 2004. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, if, I, I remember that Kermit Pallier was my 50th feature. Your 50th? Yes. Wow. So, and, so before that, I, I've done 49 movies in mm -hmm. Europe, mm -hmm. between French and a few British movies. Um, so I was, you know, my experience was strong enough to start working here, but not strong enough, I think, to to start being a Hollywood composer. That's something you learn by doing uh, Hollywood movies. Of course, of course. You know, the, 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 the size, the, the scope, the, the, the amount of music to write, all these things were... A number different. of opinions. I heard about that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's very different. Yes, because in France, yeah. uh, the director has the final cut. Okay, exactly. He's in charge. Else. Of course, you can, you can listen and hear and sometimes directors do listen and hear the producers, but he's in charge. Yeah. So you have only one person to talk to. But not only, not only that, the, 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 the way music is involved in, in the American cinema is different from European cinema, just the way it is. It is, it's very different. I mean, your, your music, um, you know, you, you, you take a piece and create an atmosphere as opposed to, in most cases, I won't say in every film because there are exceptions, but in a lot of your cases, they're very lyrical themes, and you'll take a, a, a point A and a point B and just put a piece of music between there and then you're not really trying to accentuate drama and you're more trying to take the, the viewer into the, the atmosphere you're trying to create. Yes, uh, yes, and, and, I, and I, it's, I did not invent that. It comes from uh, from the Nouvelle Vague technique, from George oh. Abu, from Maurice Jarre, from any, but also from Ben Herman. If you look at Ben Herman's scores, he doesn't hit every no, single uh, no. uh, close-up or, or, or uh, or uh, action in, in the film. He, what I like is when you, the composer can, can capture the soul of the film. I think it, 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 each film has a soul, a deep, a deep, strong uh, core made of emotions and sensations, and the music has to to express it even more. I, I, it's, it's interesting you say that because the Europeans, uh, yourself included, this so well. Um, you know, I, I always reference uh, The Godfather with Nino Rota. I mean, the, the beautiful theme that is a love theme, there's people being killed, there's sheep walking up the mountain. I mean, it works on so many levels for the, for the core of the film. And you, your theme is very much the same thing. Thank you. That's right. That's why I, I always thought that the, the, you, you, can, you, you can, you know, if we take Philomena as a, as a reference, um, Judy Dench's performance is the most important thing in the film. It's about her, and I have to preserve it. If I would uh, follow what's happening around her, I would just kill these moments. Mm -hmm. So I had to, and like in Barry Earring or other movies, I have to to watch the film and, and inhale until I have found what the music can bring more than just what is there. Do you? Um... Do you present different ideas to a director? Yes. Or, or, do you, or do you present just one idea and say, this is what I think your film is? No, I think I'm, I'm a collaborator. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, and I like, I like that. I like the idea that I'm working with a, with a director and exchanging with him. Uh, sometimes I, I nail the, the music and it's not just a theme, it could be just a, a series of chords or, or uh, an instrumental color. And, and the director immediately says, yes, that's right. And sometimes he's not, he disagrees. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's right, sometimes he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's happened before that I, I would find a theme, play it to the, to the director, he wouldn't like it. And then a few weeks later, after digging in many other territories, he would ask me to come back to the original theme. And mm -hmm. that's, but that's the way it is, what can I do? Mm -hmm. He's in charge. Now, you're a flutterist yourself. You're yes, a, yes. But, but that's a, why we have Randy Coburn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so many of your films are piano centric. The, Strange, yes. Uh, yeah, but you do, play, you do play piano. Uh, yeah, well, the piano plays me. Okay. <laughs> uh, and you, you 
So do you compose at the piano? You you like to find the, the theme of the piano, or do you get that away from the piano? Now? Uh, I compose everywhere. Uh, like you know, you know, you know, you know composers. It's a, it's a, going on all the time. Yes, it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's a, a position in life. You're a composer, which means that day and night, day and night, you compose. It could be on my Vespa. It could be in the car. It could be. A, uh, I'm swimming in a, somewhere, I don't know, it could be anywhere. And of course, sometimes I'm at the piano or watching the image or on the plane, or it could be anywhere. <coughs> and that, of course, is a moment of, of practical uh, work where I have to, to, to put together uh, a, a mock-up, a demo to play to the, to the, to the uh, director. Some directors that I've worked in, in France, I can play the piano, and that's fine. They don't need to hear any more orchestration, orchestration you know, fake orchestration. They, they trust, you know, explain to them, and they understand that it's some, but most of the time I, I do an electronic demo, which is good because it allows uh, a quick communication. I don't like the trumpet, or could we hit this section here? Could it be, be uh, darker? All these things that the piano could sometimes blur because of the, the, the nature of the instrument, where we've heard so much of silent music on piano, you know, if you play, if you play, if you play this chord on the piano. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm good. Yeah. It can sound jazzy. This is played by strings. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. on the same chord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it is the same chord. Well, it's not the same chord. Well, of, of course. Yeah. Uh, and that's why orchestration is so important to my my writing, and uh, it's actually the second element, more, more important element, but sometimes more than the melody. Do you do a lot of your own orchestration? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. When I do my demos, everything is orchestrated. Mm -hmm. Everything leaves my studio in every single... What I did, 50 movies, uh, Curve of the Pelerine, and a few after that, uh, without anybody helping me, I would do everything from mm -hmm. A to Z, mm -hmm. even the budget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the French... Uh, French way of doing things, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, I think it's everywhere except it's in here. I think you know, here there's more people that yeah. are in the process. Um, but you manage to maintain your uh, residence in Europe. You don't, yes. you don't feel you need to be in Hollywood to be in the Hollywood uh, business, the movie business. Well, I was, I was really. Um, Since I'm a child, California has been calling because my parents married here and they were still students in Berkeley and, and all my, my childhood was uh, surrounded by uh, mermaids calling me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and my, my, mother is, my mother is actually in California right now. She went back to her uh, sorority friends for the 60th or 70th mm -hmm. anniversary of the sorority. <clears throat> and the, the, um, the moment I, I broke into Hollywood, kind of, little break because Kermit the Berlin was a, such a little gentle movie um, that the, the um, it, it seemed that didn't seem the right moment it was too late or too early I had younger children at the time mm -hmm. in school in France and, and, and I still had many friends and you know directors who I was working with in, in Europe and I, I was I don't think I was prepared to come here and it's only been uh, you know, three or four years that I can, my, my daughters are now grown up so I can come here and stay more time and and, uh, and enjoy being here without the pressure of losing something that I've left to of course. From, from, from Europe. Oh, well. Do you have a favorite of your films you've done? Do you have one that really resonates with you as something that you... My film? Just, well, I mean, everybody has, you know, I know you can't have favorite children, but... Uh, you do. You do. <laughs> But sometimes a composer has an affinity with the score he worked on. Uh, I, mean, I, I know I do um, in my career that I have some. The film went nowhere. Nobody saw it. Nobody cared about yeah, it. It could be, yes. And, and uh, possibly you think it's. I've done many of those. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's something. It's, actually, it's something that's important to, to mention that until you, you make movies which are seen, you do write for movies, but nobody knows. You know, it's, that's true. That's true. That's true. There was many movies before that. So, um, uh, what did you get the most enjoyment out of working on? Where you well, the it? thing is, you can't. It's difficult to say there's one film because it's. Is it the relationship with the director, which was great? Is it um, 
to the orchestra, which was fantastic, uh, uh, or the whole process, which was so smooth. Is it because uh, you got awards from this film, even though the, 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 yeah. the, the process was uh, horrible? Yeah. There's, there's so many, so many. Um, but the challenge of, of finding that core, I, I always find that once you find that, you, you, you decide that, okay, now I, I think I've got it, I've got my arms around this, I know where I'm going. That's always a, an exhilarating moment. Of, of course, of course. And actually, as you know, the, 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 the finding moment is the fantastic, fantastic yeah. Yeah. the dopamine you get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> injection. The the, yeah, the yeah, injection yeah. is incredible. Um, I, I would, Benjamin Button was one, a trendy cover here, uh, recorded with us at Sony. Uh, one of, I think one of my first movies uh, recorded in, in Hollywood. And uh, that, that was a big Hollywood movie for me. And I, 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 and I, loved, I, loved, I loved working with David Fincher. He was extremely uh, smart, uh, uh, demanding, but in, a, in a very gentle way. Very funny, he likes wine. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and he, did he allow you a lot of latitude? That film yes. seemed to have yeah. expensive music. It, yes. went, it went everywhere. It went yes, it was, and it, which was yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I could really, I could really use many of the uh, uh, things I'd learned and, and expanded on, and and, uh, and also trans, uh, uh, trans, trans, uh, trans uh, uh, inject the my my love for the. Uh, the jazz of Ellington, oh, for example. Uh, I haven't been able to use any of the jazz or, or groovy uh, part of my, of my uh, <laughs> of myself in Hollywood movies yet. Yeah. It might come, but um, I've recorded a lot of jazz and other, other groovy things in, in Europe. But some, some re for some reason, there was, not, there was never a movie here that I could... Uh, now you've announced that you're going to be inundated. You know? mm -hmm. That's all you'll get now. That exactly. 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 I've been in niche. <laughs> and, um, but Benjamin Buttons had, had a flavor on it, of it, you know, and the way I used the instrumentation. Uh, there was no French horn, there were four saxophones. There was a blend of, of uh, French horn, alto flute, uh, uh, sorry, alto sax, alto flute, and alto playing one melody together. There was the, the, the little chord uh, movement that. Why don't you, you and uh, Randy sort of show us some of the things here? Just now, and just 
I just want to go back home and study again. <laughs> and I always travel with scores, you know, pocket scores from Stravinsky or Babel or, or Strauss or whoever with me. And, and because I, and, and I guess that's also what brought me to film music. And that's why I admire composers like John Williams, is the, the way they have uh, embraced the, the history of, of, of music. And, and they use it in, in their craft, you know, in their, in their art, which is art of cinema. Well, I mean, to, 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 not to put to find a point on it, but to the general public, and it's the film composers of this generation, it's generally more important to them mm -hmm. than it is the classical composers or the contemporary composers, because the music's more accessible. <coughs> and they can relate to, you know, they see the image that it stays with them when they leave the, the cinema. You know? sure. and that's, and that's, I guess that's also what, that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's, right. that's, that's what I love. When I was going to the cinema, that's, that's what took me to wanting to be a film composer the very early on. I've always, want, I've always wanted to be a film composer and nothing else. Mm -hmm. I wanted to compose for cinema. Mm -hmm. And it was because I was watching films all the time, cinema was my other passion. Music and cinema. And I could, I could hear all these great uh, compositions on, on screen. Could it be from Italian composers or, or, uh, or, uh, or, or Jerry Goldsmith or Williams? Anyway, yeah, 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 it's a great composer. So let's talk a little bit about uh, about Philip. Um, you did quite a bit of research, I believe, with, with Philip herself, and uh, the whole story. You got to know her quite well. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that and how that played into your music? And then you just mentioned before how you followed Judy Dench out of that world when you knew the real woman, and now you're looking at Judy Dench playing that woman. Well, this. I was looking at the soul of the film, and um, I that in, in both the movie and the life, um, is a person who's very strong, but at the same time doesn't show it. Uh, you can feel it if you get close to her. You can feel the great strength, um, the great dignity. And when you know that she's hidden a secret for 50 years to her own children and her friends and family, um, and that she's forgiven, um, well, she had, she had these questions of forgiveness, um, and that she, that she has kept this pain and sense of loss for so many years, you approach the film with a lot of um, uh, prudence. Yes, yes. You're careful. Mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to be uh, respectful. Yes, you, you know you you circle around the film like this. You just take it. because I, it, that's a film uh, I, I did say it a few times that was very difficult to score because of that um, because I was, I was worried that I would hurt that I would be intruding that I would be in the way um, and I've learned a lot by doing theatre. Uh, I, was, I wrote a lot of stage music, from Molière to, to Shakespeare, or Corneille Racine in France, Comédie Française, and, and many other places. That, you know, you, you're in the theatre and you're listening to the actors and you're trying to figure out what you want, how music can not hurt, mm -hmm. can it, you know, help mm -hmm. and propel the dialogue or, or, or a scene. And in Philomena, it's exactly the same thing. I've had to watch mostly Judy Dench, even though the acting with, with Steve Goodman is. He's doing the cutting point. Mm -hmm. he's, he's helping her being even better. Um, so I had to, to, to grasp the, the best uh, melody that would capture this soul, the best orchestration that would capture this soul, and, and the size of the orchestra that would not hurt. Did you only watch it, or did they give you the script ahead of time? No, I watched it. But but you had no script ahead of time? I watched it. And, and so how long did you watch it, or how many times did, did before you feel you really got what you wanted to do? Or did you come up with a few different... Two days. Two days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I work a lot, so, you know, my brain is used to... <laughs> but it, it was a different... I mean, this is... How many pictures have you done with Stephen Frears? Uh, it's the fourth. fourth. Yes, it uh, helps a lot. It helps a lot to, yes, to have that relationship. Yes, it's the premium. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, did he have a position <clears throat> in terms of what he was instructing you? No, what he thought about music for the film. No, no, no. He never says that. He leaves you in peace. He's, he plays the candid. You know. Oh, I don't know. 
Yes, my dear. Yes, my dear. And he says, hmm, this means you be a bit darker. Okay, which means you can put it in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so for Philomena, I was, I was thinking, because of, you know, she, this lady was a, a psychiatric nurse for 50 years. So you can imagine the strength, the humility, the dedication, um, and the simple life. And I wanted something very simple, and I, I shouldn't remember thinking that it had to be limited in range. Limited in range. Uh, for example, curve in the pearl earring, the melody would go... Uh, um, she goes up and down yeah, yeah. and motivates, and, and I thought that for, for a few minutes it had to be much more simple, much, yeah. much restrained. And I, I tried to find a, a very a, a hand size melody, you know, mm -hmm. five mm -hmm. figures, mm -hmm. just there. Mozart is my idol, idol over any other composers because of that. Because the, if you play the Requiem, if you play, if you play the Sonatas, if you play whatever you play, there's this ambiguity always between joy and, and, and melancholy. And um, there's so, always something I try to, to capture. And at the beginning of Philomena, there's a scene where uh, she's on a fair, you know, in a fairground. And that's where she's going to meet a boy, and she would have a child from meeting this boy. This thing happened. <laughs> uh, so these things happened, especially in Ireland in the 50s. And then she has to, to, to hide herself, and, and she's taken to that, this convent. Uh, and I thought that because of this fairground moment, her life will change. All her life will, have, will be stained for her as, you know, her guilt would be very strong about that. 
and the nuns will remind her a lot of course. And of course, and, and that will be also the, the, the after the, the child is abducted, that, that's the moment that you know, the child was conceived. And um, for me, it was the crucial moment that could lead us all to the film. And so in the, in the fact, when you hear in the distance this melody, played by a fair organ, and, um, and orchestrated this melody in a way that reminds us of, or echoes the sound of a fair organ using recorders, bass clarinets, string play harmonics, and it gives an eerie and haunting sound, like if it was, this music was a ghost all along the film, ghosting her. And this theme is reminding her of what happened and the pain and the loss and, and actually reminding us, the audience, to share with her this pain and this, uh, this uh, tragedy. When, uh, I imagine she's seen the film now. Yeah. Did, did she, how, how did she react to the film when she saw it? I don't know about the first time. Um, does she feel it's a, a, an accurate portrayal, or does she? No, I think she's no. I think she's very happy. She's very happy. Yeah. Okay. She thinks that maybe the character in the film is a bit silly, oh, okay. sillier than her. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and for the music, she just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the main thing. That's all we care about. Really, so. <laughs> Would you like to take some questions from a few people? Do we have any yeah, questions? Sure. You talk quite a lot about uh, the jazz <coughs> and the music and that you had to keep it quite hidden. Uh, when you came to Hollywood, did you have to keep it even more hidden than you had to in Europe? Um, I think there was not a movie that offered the opportunity of using jazz. Maybe also I was kind of shy, you know, being on... When I went to Capitol Records for the first time to the, the studio, I was, I was uh, in awe because that's the studio I've dreamed of when I was a teenager. And so I, I have some too much respect, I think, to, to start being, being a jazzer here. But uh, maybe my time will come. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to ask you about, you know, there are certain directors you've worked with quite a lot. You've, you've made uh, like five films with Frears? Four. Four films with Frears. And I know you've worked a lot with uh, Roman Polanski. <coughs> and uh, Wes Anderson, I saw the uh, yes. the Grand Budapest Hotel the other day. Oh, did you like it? Very much. Good. It's very strange. It <laughs> is. <laughs> I keep saying that it's Wes's world. Wes has a... But it's like, I can compare him to Fellini. Fellini has his yeah. own world and Wes has his own world. And he's really, really unique. Yeah, and, and, and the thing about that is like, I get the sense that um, uh, these these filmmakers really trust you a lot to get what you uh, what they're doing because I mean uh, I really like to score the Ghost Rider because that's a suspense film and it's a thriller and the score is very sort of insidiously light in there it's mm -hmm. creeping around mm -hmm. and um, I know that was made under a great deal of uh, very, under a great deal of duress on in his life the context uh, did you find it uh, were you in communication with him generally, or was... Uh, yes, it was very difficult. Uh, Roman Bolanski is one of the most uh, uh, incredible directors of, this, you know, of, of the history of cinema. Yeah. If you look at his filmography, it's just crazy. And, and he, was, he always had great scores in his films. So that's another um, thing that made me dream of working with him one day. Mm. So he called me for Ghost Writer, and uh, the second I started to write, he liked what I did, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I think I was maybe uh, less than half into the film when he got caught in Switzerland, mm -hmm. where he used to go for the last 20 years free. Mm -hmm. Suddenly something trembled. Um, and I was really in panic because I was thinking, it's poor man Polanski, and I'm, I'm not going to play score to him, maybe he can hate it. So I was really worried. And um, so we managed to pass along things through uh, his editor who was trying to finish the film. Uh, he was going to sit someone with a computer and on a little computer on a laptop they would try and, and complete uh, mm -hmm. the editing and the image frame the, the, the piece and I heard back and it was he was happy. But still he never heard two of the big pieces like the, the big piece where 
Um, even when McGregor goes on, a, on, on, the, on the ferry with a, with, a, with a car, and also the very, the very end, the very yeah. end, he never saw, he never, he never saw the finale. With the, 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 the papers in the air. Yeah, yeah, he never saw that. Yeah. And he never, I mean, he never heard, he never saw it with, with, with music. Uh, but he was happy, and that was um, the beginning of our relationship. And, and we have a new project this week. Will be our fourth annual. Oh, the driver's song. Yeah. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And, and Roman Polanski has a, something very special for composers. <coughs> he, he knows music very well, not as a musician, but mm. you know, as a, a music lover. Uh, he enjoys music in cinema. He, he enjoys music in his cinema. And he doesn't use any temp track, ever. He only trusts the composer. So he shows the film with nothing, it's fresh, and he says, go back home and do something. Surprise me. And I think we should, you know, go back to that if we can. Because when, no, wait, wait. I must say, many scores are... I mean, composers are, are yes, to be of course, composers are handcuffed because of temp track. Because the, if you if you stick a picture and an image together and listen and watch more than five times, mm -hmm. you'll be hooked. It's over. Your brain has it's Pavlovian. You want to hear the same sound of the same picture again and again. Mm -hmm. So um, um, it's fantastic to work with a director who lets you. Free. Ultimately, they're doing themselves a disservice, I think, in the long run, yeah, because yes. they're not getting something that, that could more be valuable to compose. That could be special, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I wonder if you could talk a little bit about volumes, man. Yeah. Um, exploring English World War II music, yeah. and also exploring scenes that volume. <laughs> 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 um, so, yeah, George contacted me with the idea that he wanted to do this film as a tribute to the great movies of the 50s, 60s, from Kwai to Great Escape, uh, Navarone, and he said, I want a big score, like Chomkin and, and Bernstein, and Maurice Jean would do. I said, great, that's funny, let's do that. So that's what we, we did. We sat down and I wrote the march, you know, like the Great Escape march opening, or, or Kwai, or this kind of military march, but they can be used in many different uh, orchestration and, and tempting and, and sounds uh, and emotions and uh, and he said I'll send you the script but I, I've written a, a little part for you because there's, there's a I don't have one today of course but there's a, there's a part for a Frenchman with a scarf <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then he said oh I, I, actually I wrote the third scene for you uh, I thought he was joking, but he was not. And, and these scenes are with Matt Damon, so that's another moment of, of uh, which was rather worrisome to go on the set and <laughs> you know, sit down with Matt Damon, had a stupid beret. Does <laughs> um, fly a plane? Yes, I actually guess I'm on a plane. Yeah, uh, and, and really, it's really me. <laughs> my scarf floating. <laughs> and they're going. And, and Matt Damon was fantastic. He was very sweet and very uh, helping, you know, very, very, very warm and very kind. But it was a great, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I hear that some people have not under, really understood that the movie and the score was meant to be a tribute. Uh, I've read many reviews saying that it was, it was the worst thing in the film with the music. Because people, that, I think they didn't understand that it was. It's an, it was, just, it was an homage, yeah, but it was, it was, it was nothing else. Can I ask as an artist when you read reviews like that? Um, how do you how do you handle uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> do you really? I mean, do you really? Does it? You well, know, you're saying yourself at this point in your career, obviously. Some, sometimes you you. There's always something to, to, to learn from these critics. Let's put it that way. There's always something to learn because uh, first of all, it's like an orchestra. An orchestra is a population. And the audience is a population. You can't please everyone. That's that's a that's a fact. Uh, but when a critic, which is it's his profession to to give his opinion on on, on, on cinema, and movie, and, and music in, in the film, you always try to to get something from it. You know, learn something from it. Maybe there's something wrong. Maybe there's something I should change. Or maybe he's a fucking idiot. 
She chose to keep them. You chose to keep them? Yes. So I somebody else chose them, but you agreed that they were appropriate. Yes, and, and especially the last section of the film where uh, uh, Peter Seven is played for yeah, yeah. seven or, yeah, I think, seven minutes oh, right, yeah. um, during the speech. It was the temp track. And Tom and the producers asked me to, to uh, replace that. And I said, well, let me work on the score, and when we get to there, we you know, figure it out. We'll see. So I found the theme, blah, 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 and, and we were happy. We were, and then came the time to go to the last section of the film, and I said, forget, just keep it open. Mm. Uh, I will never be able to, to replace that. <laughs> no, it's impossible. Again, because they have been listening been to, to Beethoven right. for uh, maybe two months. Uh, it, was, it was cut perfectly to the frame, to the, to the music. Yeah. What? What, what, are you I, what, I, what I'm going to do? Yeah. Huh? Write a, a piece that sounds like uh, me, which is far away from Beethoven. <laughs> makes no sense. No. Um, so the only thing that I, I tried to capture, because there was Mozart and Beethoven, was actually the, what we call the Alberti, the real thing that you know you find in many of Mozart's uh, sonatas. Mm -hmm. Except I'm using a jazz chord. So the the uh, but the experience from that was fantastic. Tom Hooper is is extremely sensitive to music, very precise, uh, and every some directors would make you change something, and you, you know that it's wrong. You know that it, they, they're pushing you the wrong way, and sometimes you have to let go. There's nothing you can do, and Tom never pushes you to the wrong direction. When he pushes you, there's always a good reason. He shows you there's another, maybe another window you have not explored yet. Yeah. Yes, and, and that's fantastic. And, and, yeah. and, and I, I, I did a lot of progress working with, with, with Tom, I think, because uh, I learned things that are, you know, I explored territories that I would not have explored. And, um, and the music seems very simple, but it's not that simple. And, and there's this thing, this, this, this other thing, which I thought was. Again, what is the soul of the film? What is? It's about a man who can't talk, who can't express himself, and he can't physically speak. And so he's. And Tom Hooper kept saying he's stuck. He's stuck. Now, so I think he's stuck. So he can't. He can't have a melody. There's no way he could have a melody. This is the melody of the film that I played, which is the melody of the duet, mm -hmm. uh, which is full of benevolence and kindness and, and generosity. Uh, and friendship, but but the king's thing couldn't be melodic. It didn't work. Uh, you would have watched this guy who can't talk and hear da 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 da. Ridiculous. So I, I, I suggest I, one day I called Tom and I said, Tom, why don't we do? And that will take me to another story. But I said, why don't we do something? Yes, trying to project something that, that never projects. And in the only moment it projects, 
At last, from this note, let us meditate with Shasta. When at the end, he manages to make his speech in, in, uh, in the Abbey, mm -hmm. at the rehearsal. That's the only moment in the film, after five reels, that you hear the melody that of the Kilkel. Oh, that's incredible. It's it's incredible. Do you want to play a little bit for us, man? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. a project because you feel you'd be you, you'd be fine and it would be a great experience. It's actually one of the most important uh, things in, in my choices, you know, the topic, uh, the director or the producers because I know them or because we have experienced some great things together. Um, uh, and of course, do I want to spend, you know, a few weeks, sometimes a few months with these people uh, and uh, because my life stops. But my life becomes their life. I live with them, I live with their film, with their, with their, with their work. I'm, I'm not, I forget everything about me. I just live like a samurai and, and I write music day and night. Mm -hmm. So, um, unfortunately, sometimes you think that it would be great, and it's not. But that, there's, there's nothing you can do. It's, sometimes people in life are disappointing also. Well, they change too. I mean, you might meet them socially, and you think something, and then once they become yes, you, you realize they're controlling, and they're not going to allow you. Yes, you, in terms yes. Of sometimes you feel great enthusiasm, and when you start working, you realize that they don't—they want anything but music. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. They want. They have this um, uh, fantasy that they want music. They need music in the film. There has to be music, and it has to be me. Okay, good. But then. Music is not what I thought. Uh, they have another perception of music. Of yeah. Music is, is a mix of things with the sound and, and referring to their ten tracks anyway. And, and um, certainly not with that melody and maybe not this course, maybe just the drum doing... <laughs> it's two minutes already. That's great. Perfect. <laughs> but that's the way it is. And you can't, you can't, you can't. You know. uh, but that's, I mean, you, you, you move on and I'm lucky because I wouldn't want to be a director and spend three years doing a movie. I'm lucky because I can jump from another sure. project right away and, you know, be in, in better seas or waters, you say. Yeah. So what do you have coming up? Anything exciting you'd like to tell us about? Yes, I have. Uh, I'm completing Godzilla, as we speak. I've never done a monster movie. I've never, been, I've never done something of that scale. Maybe Harry Potter, but Harry Potter has another story. You know, it's just monsters. I remember that I was excited because I, I've 
mentioned my passion for Bernard Herrmann and, and all these B movies that he, you know, Jason and the Argonauts, the, 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 the day the, 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 the earth was still, still yeah. how, to, how to pronounce, um, they, they resonate in me. I, I know the scores very well uh, of Fahrenheit. I know these, these movies very, very well and, and their, their scores. And, and uh, I wanted to take the, you know, take the chance uh, to go from something very minimal like I did for Venus and Fur mm -hmm. and Polanski movie and to that huge thing, very loud and very noisy, with a great young director, British director Gareth Edwards, very talented. Then I have Angelina Jolie's new directorial, uh, oh. which this is, is the uh, one she shot in Australia. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, the bad movie, the bad movie, the the athlete, the, the American athlete, yes, and broken. Um, and many other projects in France, the, the new Roman Polanski, uh, a new movie in Italy with Matteo Garone, who did Gomorra, and I did uh, reality with him, which had uh, the contrary prize in, uh, in, uh, in Cannes last year, um, and yeah, many other things. What do you do to relax in between movies? What do you do to get yourself In between movies? <laughs> uh, well, in between movies. There's Is there any between? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, it's very strange because since I've always dreamed of writing for films, I'm now surrounded by incredible directors with fabulous projects from Frias to Polanski to Fisher to uh, uh, Alfred to Clooney to uh, Jolie to I mean, Caroni, all these incredible and other French directors, Bordeaux or Jacques Audiard, who I made six mm -hmm. movies with. Mm -hmm. and, and they call me back. What should I do? Go on holidays? <laughs> I guess I'll sleep in my grave. <laughs> and, and, and also the, you know, I try to, as I said, I live, I live like a samurai. I don't go out. I don't, uh, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I just, you know, just, I just run every day or every other day. I, and I try to, uh, to be in shape and, and be focused. I, I, I read a lot of music. That's what I do most of the time. And I read a lot. Yeah. Uh, I've read uh, several books at the same time. Mm. I think that's going to wind us up today because of uh, other commitments. But please, it's thank you. It's getting cold here. Alexander. <laughs>